talk about culture. We know culture. We want to be happy. It's fine. We need to. Maybe you've heard stuff like this before. If so, that's great. If not, I want to impress what our company feels is very important to us, and maybe we can share. And likewise, since it's 9 o'clock in the morning and I haven't had enough coffee, there will be profanity for this series. Okay. What is culture? When you are asked to do talks like this, I've done this talk three times in the last four days, you are, uh, the first thing you do is, of course, you go to Wikipedia. What does Wikipedia say culture is? Organization culture is the vision, values, norms, systems, symbols, language, assumptions, beliefs, and habits. What the fuck does that mean? Nobody knows. We like to say culture is kind of fluffy. You can't really pin it down. Do we know what this is? I don't know what this is. Maybe a line? That's a fair. Let's try it. Maybe a culture is what makes developers happy. So I, uh, I started in the San Francisco office with Atlassian. In all of our offices, including San Francisco, what do you have? You have beer on tap. Everywhere you go, you have beer. It's a company started by Australians, which is a nickname for alcoholics. Beautiful. Yeah? Beer every day. Ping pong. We have ping pong everywhere. That's cool. We have free food. Really fucking cool. Also, not fucking cultural. It's not. This is just things that make us happy. Likewise, when we get upset, we shoot each other with burgers. Also cool, still not cultural. So, fail twice. That's not cultural. Let me start maybe by saying, let me give you a bad culture example. I used to work in a company, I can't legally tell you what that company is, but I can tell you that it rhymes with metal, and they make up much. Um, when I was working in this company, I was a developer on one of the front end systems. I found love in one of the back end systems. And I decided, ah, this is not good, this is going to prevent me from doing my job. So what did I do? I raised a ticket in June, which is our, our ticket system at Alaska. Uh, the back-end team looked at it and said, no, close work. This is awful. Like, this prevents me from working. I can't do my job. So I email my manager, who emails the other guy's manager, and then four months later, after many, many meetings, it's like, ah, this is actually a problem. And it was fixed in three days. That's a bad example. Why are companies acting like that? What, why do we get into this situation where we're so ineffective and so just, Turns out it's his fault. <coughs> Do, does anyone know this man by his face? No? Frederick Winslow Taylor. He's known for Taylor. A Taylorism is something like, we should treat people like machines. He was very much on, there are two classes of people. There's the efficient workers, who do one skill really well. That's all they do. They take a rivet, they put it in the hole. They take a rivet, they put it in the hole. And thinking managers. These guys are paid to go think up what the efficient workers are supposed to do. That's all they do. And then they go down and micromanage down to the official workers. Take this rib and put it in the hole. Now, there's a reason this exists, right? What they were trying to do, and you know, Frederick Winslow Taylor isn't necessarily a dick. What he was trying to do is to have an efficient input and output. You want to know what you're getting as you go through this process of development. However, times have changed. We're not the same people anymore. We don't do the same work. The work has changed. You all as developers, we like at Atlassian call knowledge workers. We pay you, or rather we pay developers like you 
from the top down say, ah, go innovate. I'm your manager, go be innovative. We all laugh. Every time I do that slide, I laugh. Do 
not forget them. They are very important. Let me give you two examples of customers of ours. One is named Emma. She's based in San Francisco. She is a project manager who is working in Confluence, our wiki, but is still learning uh, the, new, the new features of Confluence and trying to get a handle on kind of what she can do for her team. Likewise, we have William, the stereotypical system administrator. He's been admitted, I know, only in the U.S. I've, known, I've met all the administrators here in France, not in the world. This is a U.S. administrator, my fault. But William has been administrator in Confluence since 2006. Uh, he's based in California as well, and he is a, a very much a power user. He knows all the keyboard shortcuts. He's super awesome. Now, here's the thing. Uh, these guys are fake. Totally fake. Uh, and the reason why they're fake is that the last hand we use for some reason. When we're developing, we want to give a face to our customer. We want to give them an actual kind of persona around uh, groups of customers that come to us and kind of the groupings that we find them. So we give them an actual face. Likewise, we give them a backstory. We go really, we get pretty intense with this. We give them a scorecard on kind of the things they're really strong at, the things they're passionate about. And we in the last game are very passionate about uh, personas. This is literally a picture from the San Francisco app. It's the second one. Our personas are everywhere. We see them everywhere. Likewise, when our, uh, the team that made uh, the personas uh, made them and put them out everywhere, our company actually, our members of our company, got really into this, so they decided to make their own personas. This is Vernon the Morning who likes to watch your head. I know the man who made this. Okay. Recently, we've actually started developing Persona cards. These cards we use literally as playing cards. When you're starting to develop a feature, you can use these playing cards to say, I want to make this feature and I really think it'll benefit William. And someone else will come back and go, I don't know if Emma would really like this. I don't think this is very intuitive. And you can begin to literally play some cards for all of our personas. We also use these personas when we are developing new features on our walls. In our Sydney office, all of our walls and all of our development floors are whiteboards. When we're developing new features, we are sketching these out publicly. And anybody can walk by and go, you know, I really think this is interesting the way that you're developing this, but hmm, I don't know if this would really make sense if you do this in business. We take this very seriously. We are very passionate both about our happy developers, but also our customers. Now, Atlassian is a 1,600 uh, employee group now. So how do you take a group that's grown from 400 when I joined three years ago to 1,600 and still maintain this, this culture, this, this happiness? 12. Does anyone know what the number 12 is? It's the natural size of the team. If you go all the way back to hunting woolly mammoths, we actually hunt in groups of 12 as well. For whatever reason, this seems to be the case. At Alaskan, we do it in groups of 12. Seven for our scrum teams plus five for 150. Who knows this one? Come on, people. It's number. It's actually coincidentally the number of maintainable, stable relationships one can have. It is coincidentally also the number of Facebook friends you will ever message in your life uh, for more than like once or twice. Not going on this, but you know. So, in a company of 1600 with the Dunbar's number of 150, what you end up is having the size of You have the like super awesome developers who are trying to use this open source project to reach across the legal team and like, hey, what do you use this open source product? This is pretty fucking cool. The legal team goes, no. And you have the same problem of jumping across the aisle and you don't really have a clear vision into all these different teams because to be quite honest, your brain can't handle bringing these people together. So, how do you bring these people together? The last thing we have a very specific method for doing this. We developed this a long time ago and this is what we have done ever since uh, the company was founded in the uh, early 2000s. So, when you're reaching across the company as a developer across the other legal team, this is not you guys, you see a blank face. And that's shit. You don't know who this person is. You have no concept of who you're talking to. So at Alaskan, we try to give everyone a face. Every member who joins the company, every single employee, writes an introductory blog post and shares it with the entire organization. This is Ben Humphreys. He's a developer in Sydney. Likewise, Ben likes to play guitar. When he's introducing himself, now he has some idea of like, ah, this is who I am, this is what I do. And you can start some conversations about it. This promotes transparency in our organization. And we find this to be part and parcel to what Atlassian is and how Atlassian works. When we win together, we share it. This is a design award that we won for the HipJet team, if I'm not mistaken. When we fail together, we share it. 20% time in our company was broken. One of our developers brought this up, who had been there for a long time, and was starting a conversation about how we fix this. When we have technical matters that need to be discussed and agreed upon, we share this, and the entire company gets a chance to speak. And inevitably, we will come to an agreement. 
Likewise, when our founder asked what Atlassian looks like in 2016, he asked us a public question. And the entire company gets a chance to respond and is actually listened to. Interestingly enough, the number one voted question was how do we share our culture? How do we open source it? Hence, here I am. <laughs> and lastly, we also use chat. Chat, we, we believe, especially with HipChat, causes transparency in your organization. You can connect with teams in chat rooms. Inside these chat rooms, if a team member goes offline, for instance, I've been gone for a week, when I come back, I'm going to check all the chats that I've gone and catch back up on the conversation. Much cleaner than email in our opinion. Likewise, we connect our build systems, all of our ticketing systems to our chats. You can just join a room and simply say, I'm because we feel transparency brings people together and spreads our <coughs> Now, I have a minute and a half. Let's see if I can get this. This is all well and good. You can tell someone, have a customer in mind, be in one team. And you know, this is still kind of fluffy culture, but it's a lot. There's some core tenets to what this culture actually means and how it actually exists as it grows over time. You know, the problem is, you can say to someone, balance your passion, but nobody really remembers this. They don't really have it in their mind. So at Atlassian, we use values. Each one of these values represents one of these core tenets of our culture. And these values we take very, very seriously. They are everything. Because, to, in our opinion, values give our culture stability. Values are the skeleton in which your culture is. Your culture may grow, you may gain weight, you may gain muscle, but your skeleton doesn't change. Our values are up everywhere. My favorite is still open company, no bullshit. It's the one that is the core tenet, I think, of the last thing called. So, in the last 46 seconds, let me give you one more thing. Does anyone remember pink? I see one person saying no, but that's really awesome. Uh, Ping was uh, built into iTunes, and it's like a social network for sharing your music. It was a crappy idea. Really good developers, awesome developers, who made a really good product that just inevitably was the wrong place, wrong time. Here's what we like to say. Products come and go. At Atlassian, we want to be around for the next 100 years, but we know Jira or HipChat won't be around for the next 100 years. Maybe. Who knows? But if it is, who cares? What we want is our culture to stay. Because that's what is who we are, and that's what's the most important.